Jerome Wagner. I grew up in the town of Wayne. Um, I recently returned after 30 years in uh, the southern tier of New York State. Uh, up there, I raised three children and I worked as an environmental engineer. Um, I was fortunate while I was working to actually have some experience of fracking. <coughs> in the northern part of Pennsylvania, fracking was going on already. Uh, and I'll, we'll be discussing what fracking is, so you'll get a better understanding of that as we go through here. Plus, at the company where I worked, we had an industrial wastewater treatment facility that we wanted to find new customers for. So we actually were looking at fracking waste <coughs> as a commercial opportunity. So I had the opportunity to visit some frac sites, gather samples, and also do some, uh, some technical work, some bench testing relative to how you could treat frac waste. So I do have sort of a unique uh, background as far as fracking goes. Um, now, the Franciscan response, I'll say a couple words about them. It's a relatively new group. It's a year and a half or so in age. It's centered at St. Mary's Parish, which is a Franciscan parish also, um, in Pompton Lakes. It's multi, multi or non, multi-denominational or non-denominational. So we don't exclude other Christians, and we certainly would welcome other uh, non, non, non-theological people. Anyway, so we're an open group, but we're also an active group. Part of what we do is education in a community um, through tabling, like we're doing today downstairs, um, and uh, through events like this. We also do legislative outreach. Uh, when, when votes are coming up at the state level for uh, say fracking waste, we engage with the local politicians and give them our opinions and you know prompt them to uh, be careful about the decisions they make there. So we do legislative outreach. We're also, um, we've also done letter writing you know but to the record and so forth. So those are the ways that we typically engage. Some of our members have gone beyond that to some direct actions related to piping and that kind of thing, but that's, that's above and beyond what the Franciscan response typically does. Uh, Francis, St. Francis, uh, among the pantheon of Catholic or Christian saints, is credited with being, you know, very close to nature, of having special relationship or with animals and plants and so forth, you know, beyond the normal, it's a nice day out type of thing. Um, so he's felt to be, you know, that kind of uh, spiritual entity for us. Um, so besides France, it, this being out of a Franciscan parish, I think it's appropriate also that the group itself, which is trying to look at things more, less in an oppositional manner, but more in a collaborative manner, you know, and from a spiritual level, um, you know, rather than some of the other groups, which may be more um, openly confrontational and that kind of thing. We try to maintain respect, you know, with other people, if nothing else. Um, so, uh, so that's a little bit about the Franciscan response. Um, we do have a table downstairs. You're welcome. Please come down. We're actually giving away a couple of prizes during the course of the, well, by the end of the afternoon, we'll do a drawing based on an informational quiz and a call to the president. Um, so we'd be, we'd be glad to have you downstairs and stop in to see us. All right. So I, I want to start off, though, uh, with a little bit of crowd engagement here. Um, who knows what fracking is? And the Franciscan response, you can put your hand up, but I'm not paying attention to you, okay? So of the, of the three or four other people in the room, who are, who's familiar with fracking? Okay, fine. You've heard the term or you sort of have an understanding of the technology? I watched uh, Gasland. Gasland, okay. So did I. Fine. Had you also seen Gasland? Okay. Uh, informed group? Fine. Now, all right, so you're, you're more informed than the general population probably. This is just another sort of sounding out question. Do you feel that fracking is a positive development or a positive means of continuing our civilization at this time. So show of hands, is, this a, is fracking a favorable thing? I, I'll put my hand down. <laughs> is fracking possibly an unfavorable thing? Oh, fine, I'm gonna be <laughs> preaching to the choir, you know, I mean, there's no point. All right, so we'll go through this, but again, if, if you feel, since it's a small group, and again, if, you, if you're knowledgeable, you may as well help contribute as we're going through here, okay? I'm gonna start by talking about the resource uh, of, shale gas. And again, I'll, I'll go through these charts relatively quickly. Norbert is keeping an eye on my time because I don't want to get bogged down. I want to allow, you tell me to rush to get going. Okay. So conventional versus unconventional. The old way, historically, we've been able to drill down into deposits of gas or oil that just then, once you punctured them into the re reservoir, the stuff basically came out on its own. Or you could pump it out of the reservoir readily. 
unconventional or the means of extraction we're doing now, including hydraulic fracturing, is much more involved. And we'll get into the technology as we get through into the talk. You know, going down and then actually turning the drill to go into a certain strata of geology. And thereafter doing some hydraulic fracturing to open the, uh, the stone up and release gas or oil into the, the carrier pipe. Now, again, we used to do this. This was what we were used to. This is where we got dollar a gallon type of gasoline. You know, we're getting into much more tech, uh, advanced technologies now, not only, you know, drilling on land for, you know, in fracking situations, but, you know, drilling at deep sea, drilling in the, at the Arctic Circle. Those are what I would call extra, extreme extraction, including, say, mountaintop removal. So, again, it's, just a, it's a move in from a, to a more risky, on one hand, more technically involved and challenging approach than we had gotten used to over the past 100 years. The, the geology that, the, that either oil or gas is being extracted from is typically shale in these cases. Now, this chart, the shaded areas indicate where there is shale that would produce gas or oil. Um, and you can see that much of the country uh, is either blessed or blessed on the side of the coin, you know, with having these kinds of resources. The one of the most real, real, you know, most adjacent interest is the Marcellus. The Marcellus Shale it covers parts of Ohio, uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and part of New York State. And so that's the closest uh, shale play to us. There's actually a small bit that comes into uh, Sussex County um, up in the very northwest part of the state, but that's of relatively little uh, interest economically. Uh, but anyway, now also some of this goes into the Delaware River Basin, which presently has a moratorium against fracking, okay? So the western part of Pennsylvania, though, has been highly developed or was aggressively developed, you know, up until a couple of years ago with, uh, you know, uh, fracking type things. Again, no, uh, now a lot of these areas are also actively producing now. Down in Texas, there are a number of formations that are already tapped so that we already are using fracked gas in our homes and in our systems at this time. Again, though, this is sort of, it's a pervasive resource. What, what do the, the capital bold letters, do they designate anything different than the uh, other? They're, 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 I know it's the back end and the Fayetteville and the Marcellus are. Uh, that's a good. That mean that it's active? Uh, the, that's and the best the way. I, I actually did not pay attention to that uh, idio, you know, detail. Um, I think. It looks like those are the active ones. Yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, yeah, I know that the Barnett, the uh, Haynesville, the Fayetteville, I know that those are already tapped. I know that some are also tapped as well out here. So the Niobrara, the Ma Mallory may be tapped. I know we're, s anyway, so I can't interpret that uh, carefully or discreetly at the moment. Norbert? No, I'm just looking while you talk. And I'm not sure that that, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Now, I the, think you're right, there is a group in the United States called, uh, uh, called the Energy Information Administration, EIA. And they produce some very interesting reports. I mean, if, you have, if you're interested in energy use in the country, it's definitely a worthwhile thing to go and Google the EIA and look for their annual reports uh, or their outlooks. Anyway, this comes from one of those reports. And what it's doing is it's tabulating amounts of shale gas reserves and other conventional types of uh, reserves as well. Uh, now, the point I want to make here is that we've heard the president and other people, including industry, talk about a 100-year supply of shale gas. I think that's a common thing. I think the president referred to it in his last State of the Union address. In any event, there's a relatively large amount of gas that they're referring to there. However, that includes unproved reserves. What it basically says is, we have a very large amount, we think. You know, and that's about all that amounts to, frankly. You know, it's a hope and a prayer on the part of different people, you know, that, that, that this amount of reserve actually exists. On the, the amount that's actually proved is more on the order of 100, 100 trillion cubic feet, which is a, a, a big number, but it's nowhere near this particular number. The proved reserves, again, are only 14% of that number that we've talked about even in presidential policy. So it's sort of an important thing to keep in mind. Um, all right, this is a figure that shows the current usage of shale gas. Again, I mentioned already that some of those reserves are tapped already. Uh, we're already using domestically something like 
of our gas is shale gas. The rest is coming from other types of deposits. You know, and I'm not going to try to describe what those are because I can't do that effectively. Now, over time, that amount is not expected or planned or forecast or hoped, uh, you know, depending on who, you're, who, you, who you are, to grow from 23% to more like 49%. So again, this sort of shows you know, what the complexion of gas usage might turn out to be over the coming years. But the one point, one point I want to make here, though, is that we do still have a substantial amount of conventional deposits available. You know that we could work with and perhaps forestall some of this other development. Uh, hydraulic fracking is a short term, like shorthand, for a relatively complex process. I'm, well, it's a complex process. Okay, up until a couple of years ago, we could not do, and I'm talking the industry, the people who wanted to do this, could not achieve what we now achieve on a regular basis. We're at ten minutes already. Okay. Uh, I'll just point out some key features. This vertical portion can easily be at least a mile deep. I think they, they uh, at least a mile deep. Then they turn into a strata, which looks pretty large here, but frankly, this is only hundreds of feet in, in depth. It's a relatively thin slice of geology that you're trying to get into. Which, uh, and, it, and then after they've drilled that uh, and directionally drilled this, then they do some, they perforate the carrier pipe and they uh, then force water and chemicals and sand into the pipe and into these cracks to then grow the cracks, expand them, you know, crack it up type of thing. Um, and then the water is allowed to leave that carrier pipe um, on, and, and, you know, be removed. And then gas or oil, the desired product, will start to flow into the carrier pipe and up to the wellhead. So again, this is a very, con it's involving sensors, software, skilled technicians, that kind of thing to do this. It's, it's, I mean, they do it with, you know, good accuracy and efficiency, but it's a complicated uh, method of, um, a, a complicated process. And Jerome, what percentage of that toxic water does come back up? Fine. Now we may, well, another point, another point is that we use three to five million easily, million gallons to just get into, to functionally treat this well. Now, of the, all, all the, of the three to five million that you put into this hole, about half or a third, somewhere, uh, somewhere, you know, half of it or so, let's say generally, will come back out and have to be treated afterwards after having been contaminated. And the rest of it will stay just sort of trapped in the geology as potentially a long-term risk. All right, so uh, you do have other things shown here, like a water table, which might be drinking water. Again, and not only drinking water, but irrigation an irrigation source. So typically, you know, it, the active area for the fracking is pretty distant from your water table. But again, that's, and then things like casings are used to protect the water resource. Again, now all of these are man-made things you might involve in concrete or steel, which are all subject to degradation over time, especially if you have active geology and, you know, seismic activity and so forth. This is a picture of a typical well site. It's uh, not very, clear. You've got a drill rig here, which is, you know, drilling that vertical and that other directionally drilled thing. You have support vehicles. You have ponds. In this case, this looks like it might be a dirty pond, a waste pond. Here you have a clean pond, you know, f reserving uh, fresh water for the frack job. Part of what goes on here is an industrialization of the landscape. You know, you have areas that may have been forest initially. They may have been uh, farmland and so forth. In any event, you're building access roads, you're building this other, uh, you know, doing this other activity, building ponds and so forth. So it changes how the landscape uh, looks. And another point here is that industry envisions putting in over half a million of these around the country, and 70,000 just in Pennsylvania. And it, it, oh, from overhead, it begins to look like a, a checkerboard of, of disturbance. You know, I'll call it disturbance, okay? And I think pictures are available of the Colorado landscape, again, from an elevated from a high elevation so you can get a sense of how things are looking now. I talked about frac fluid, and this is uh, one component which I, I guess becomes the focus of our problem with fracking. Not only are you using very large amounts of water, millions of gallons of water for a single well, and you, you'll end up fracking a single well several times during its lifetime. You, you, may do, you may have to come back to it several times just to get it to re-stimulate, to get it to work again. 
not only are you using large amounts of water, but you're also loading it up with a number of different chemicals. Uh, things like acids to dissolve minerals, and bactericides to stop fouling, um, friction reducers so that it, it's not, so it doesn't create as much resistance to pushing it into the hole. But not only that, you know, a gelling agent so that it'll carry sand along with it. It's a very, con it's an engineered fluid. This, uh, you know, it's sort of an engineering marvel that they came up with this kind of thing. But in any event, so it's not just water anymore. It's water with a, a fair amount of crap, fair amount of stuff in it. Some of these chemical crap, all right. Uh, some of them are toxic. Some of them are, are injurious. You know, if you get acid on you, that's harmful. Uh, there, there's stuff in here that's meant to kill bacteria. It, it, inherently, it's not the stuff you want to have. You know, you don't want to drink that stuff. There have been instances where animals, livestock, have drunk frac fluid or that got into their, their fields inadvertently, and they died. Or they had uh, reproductive problems with their offspring. You know, so it's a, this is not good stuff. And anyway, so that's sort of, you know, that's one of the points I wanted to make. All right, now we wanted to just take a stop. I think I'm running a little bit long at the moment, so I need to, 15. I need to keep moving along. But I, I want to see if there are any questions. And again, even from the folks who've heard about fracking, I'd like you to add what you've heard of or, you know, just from a technical, we'll get into the environmental and the negative, the uh, deleterious impacts in a moment. On this part, any questions we can try to clear up? <coughs> or points you would want to highlight or underscore? I'll take that. I, I, Wait, I'll, fine, we'll let Liz ask a question. <laughs> uh, how do they determine whether it's gas coming out of the shale deposits or oil? Uh, we're getting gas from Marcellus sh uh, Shale? Gas is coming out of the Marcellus Shale. But in, the, in North Dakota, <coughs> in the Bakken, it's actually oil that they're getting out. Now, how that, I think that's probably just an attribute of geological time. And I think they, the, the geologists who have studied this have d dig core samples, and they have an idea what's down under the ground. So they would know going into an area whether they're going to hit liquid petroleum or gaseous petroleum. And in some cases, you'll get both. I mean, out here, they're getting both. And they're flaring off the night the gas. They're just burning the gas in the fields, not even trying to get them to market because it's of no value to them. But you know, so it, it's mixed. It, it depends on the geology. And the, and the temperature history of the, on the geology. It's the temperature history of the basin, too, okay. whether you get Oil, oil and gas, or gas. Um, okay. I was going to ask you though, I mean, on the fracking process, um, did, I, I know they try to keep it all. You know, they, they try not to uh, publicize the what they use and, and how efficient it is. But I, w I wonder if if there's any, if you have any idea. If they you just use, for example, if they just use water and sand, as opposed to using water, sand, and all these other chemicals, whether it would make a hundred percent difference, a fifty percent difference, or a two percent difference. That's a good point, and I haven't seen any data on that. Now, there's a guy, Anthony and Graffia. There's a guy who used to work in the industry who's done a lot of informational presentations in New York State and Pennsylvania to communities that are facing fracking. He probably knows the history of you know, the engineering tests that were done to say what's, they, they probably have an experimental basis for all that stuff. I haven't seen that information. So I, I presume it exists in the, you know, in the, maybe. It, maybe. Uh, yeah, one of the other problems is that you, um, you hinted at was that we don't know they keep it secret, all the different, the cocktail mix. Right. Part of the, we'll, we'll talk about exemptions to existing regulations in a few minutes. One, the, one of those regulations was a Safe Drinking Water Act, which, pr which typically would require an industrial entity to name to the interested public Disclose. the specific chemicals that are being used. However, that the gas industry, the energy industry, was exempted from that requirement, so they're able to effectively put these chemicals into the ground without you know, adequate knowledge and awareness on the part of uh, the general public. So that, that, yeah, so as he says, um, secrecy has allowed that to happen. And that's, that was a deliberate uh, exemption provided to the industry it's, it's some years ago. All right, I'm going to uh, move on. All right, so we talked about a couple of different things. I mean, the resource itself, how it's extracted. I mean, what, I mean I, in my, what kinds of things haven't I talked about yet so far that you may already be aware of? 
I mean, I've alluded to them a little bit in my language earlier, you know, that some of this may not be. All right, so anybody? Norbert, Liz, what haven't I talked about? Uh, what the uh, environment is going to look like after they're finished and what it's looking like while they're doing it. Okay, that's the one point. Well, you, you mentioned that there, the Marcellus Shale is not in New Jersey, but we have a pipeline in New Jersey carrying fracked gas through our state and very close to this area. Uh, of William Patterson University. It's not happening in Ringwood, Mawa, and West Milford. And not only the fat gas, but that toxic cocktail of uh, the, uh, hydraulic waste product. Waste product. They are also piping that through and building the, uh, putting a pipe. And the worst part of it all, besides uh, destroying the environment where they're running the pipeline, it's to go underneath the Monksville Reservoir. Right. Okay, so those are some aspects. I mean, I've sort of glanced on some of these things, environmental. So what's the environmental d impacts or the deleterious aspects? You know, what might be the health impacts? And I don't, I, uh, so, I mean, there's another side of the picture. My point is there's another side to the picture. We have a technology that works, great. We have resources, great. Okay, what, are, what haven't we been told quite so openly about by industry or other people that uh, might otherwise, you know, add that to the picture. Um, I'm going to call it an unresolved challenge. Okay, I'm trying to be a little bit neutral and objective here, not totally strident and telling them to go to hell. Okay, I'm trying to be a little bit respectful, let's say. Um, so, an unresolved challenge. How do you treat the waste? Now, water, you know, we know how to treat sewer waste from your home. We know how to treat certain industrial wastes. Now, th this becomes a very complicated cocktail. I mean, not only we had all those chemicals I showed in the other thing, you know, the gel, the gel agents, the bactericides, the mineral, the, the acids and bases. Not only do you have all that stuff, but you put this stuff down in these geologic formations and you end up with all kinds of salt coming out. Well, where the hell did that come from? How, how do you treat that? Again, that, that's not really all that straightforward. In some areas, like the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, there's appreciable radioactive content. Okay, well, what are you gonna do with that now? Um, you end up with, you know, petroleum and volatile organic content from the deposit itself. You know, you're trying to extract this oil and gas, but it's intimately mi mixed now with this water you got to treat. Um, my point is, this is a very complex fluid. And again, I mentioned earlier that as an environmental engineer working, you know, in, in water treatment in an in industrial setting, we got to play with some of this stuff. And we did some engineering work with some, you know, big entities, some people who think about these. You're talking about a non-conventional means of treatment. If you're trying to restore the purity of this stuff, it takes some doing, okay? Uh, multiple, it might involve chemical precipitation steps, it might involve um, evaporation steps, it might involve biological treatment steps, which is, I mean, those are, you, you put those together, they all sort of can be practiced in an individual setting. We you have to do them all, at the, all together on millions of gallons of, weight, of waste. That's an that's a appreciable task. My point is, it's, it's, my point is, it's nothing like normal wastewater treatment. You put this into a municipal plant and a lot of the waste, a lot of the contaminants are going to blow, are just going to bypass essentially the whole process, end up in the river and potentially cause new problems. And there have been some instances of that, which I'll refer to in a minute or two. Um, so waste treatment is an unresolved issue. And as I said, out of a single well, you can easily get a million and a half gallons of, of this stuff, you know, 200, 300 tank wagons of this crap that have to be treated. Other challenges, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these. I'll point to a couple of them. Uh, wells, right from the get-go, because you're talking about a relatively complex process, uh, going into strata that you can't even observe, I mean, you can't see into the ground with x-ray vision all that easily. You know, so you're, you're hoping that your process is working properly to you know, do some of these things. At the very onset, you can end up with 6% failure in your wells. That's, even, that's just because of variations in the production process or, or you know, irregularities in the geology. You know, who knows? Over the longer term, it's very possible or maybe even likely that they will all fail in some manner. And for me, a failure means that now gas or oil can get into, say, drinking water or surface water or uh, deeper aquifers we haven't had to tap yet. 
or whatever. They just sort of mix things up and it would become a toxic, uh, new, well, I was going to say nuisance, become a toxic impact on communities that otherwise rely on those resources. And again, that's, it's not just me making up numbers. It's just sort of, it, there are published numbers of failure rate. And uh, the, the thinking is, again, you got, you got ground that it's not as static as you might think. Things are going to crack and age over time. You're going to, the things that were supposed to block flows at day, z, day one may not be blocking them 10 years. And again, you might have an impacted community at that time. Explosions, they're routinely in a paper, not well, periodically in a paper, you'll see reports of explosions. There might have been one out in Jersey City or along the Hudson recently. Anyway, so explosions, again, we're handling a toxic and uh, dangerous material. You know, that's one point. Um, we're going to talk about global warming in a moment. I, in my estimation, that's a significant area of uh, problem. And the last one I'll point to for now is, do we have appropriate policies, regulations, monitoring, and enforcement in place now? You know, so that what we do, you know, today, yesterday, whatever, is being done in a uh, rigorously controlled, well, protective manner. All right. So those are just some other. Let me just add, uh, you, you, the, the fracking process is exempt from uh, Clean Water Act in terms of uh, injecting these fluids. Is it also is the is the are these wells also exempt from the fact that if, if you drill if you drill an oil well, for example, today in Texas, just a regular conventional oil well, you're, after you're finished getting your oil, you have to fill it back in. Do they have to fill their wells back in? Uh, that's a good point, and I haven't I haven't studied that as much. I believe that I believe that the it, yeah I, I'm going to say yes. Say about failures of the of the casing, for example, wouldn't matter if you filled it back in with cement. So. Okay, but one of the issues is that less than 50% of that frac fluid comes back up. So that's down there. It's, down up. There. it's beyond the casings going down. It's now gone horizontally yeah. around under, for at least a mile or more, underground in all directions. And they're going in all directions like a spoke of a wheel. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of, the, one of the major concerns. Also, Jerome, you said that they are, they're going to keep returning to these wells to, keep, to refract, to try to get them out. And so how, have you seen any time frame for that? Uh, I, I've seen uh, something like five to seven years yeah. between refracts just to redevelop or get the mm -hmm. thing active again. Yeah, and um, of course, this is the beginning of, of, a, of, of some of this type of technology. Yeah, it, we're very early so in the... So right. we don't know whether they'll be doing this for 10, 30, uh, years. From an investment standpoint, some of the investors or the companies doing this must be hoping for 20 to 30 year lifetime out mm -hmm. of these wells. Uh, so I, I can't completely address the yeah. point that you made earlier. Yeah, um, a lot of very good questions that need to be answered. Uh, all right. Let me talk about the regulatory environment for a bit. Um, Again, this whole, the whole fracking thing between directional drilling and coming up with this engineered fluid and so forth <coughs> is very recent. Some people will say that we've been doing this for 40 or 50 years. That's not a complete picture. That's not a complete, that's a misleading uh, answer. It's relatively new technology. The, the, back in 2005, um, the Energy Policy Act of this country um, included what are uh, euphemistically called the Halliburton loopholes. But which, which codified things like exemptions from the Safe Drinking Water Act, exemptions from RECRA, which is a waste management um, uh, act regulation, um, and a number of others. And I didn't list them all up here. I didn't review them before the talk. But I believe that there are essentially exemptions from CERCLA, you know, from Superfund type stuff, from air pollution type stuff, from water pollution. In, in my mind, it's pretty pervasive. Anything that was out there to protect the environment, I think it had its leg legs cut out from it relative to fracking through this particular act. So sadly, you know, we have a, a, a legislative or a policy structure which is allowing, which is embracing fracking and in fact endorsing it. And that's true even of the more recent blueprint for clean and secure energy future, which the president uh, touted recently and which was published around, you know, just last month, which still relies on frac gas, which is basically using the State Department to market this abroad 
blah, blah, blah. So f I'm, I'm sorry, but you know, uh, the country is going in a different direction. You know, but again, that's not to say that's the right direction, at least not in my mind. Now, some people will also suggest that state regulations are good enough. I'm going to say they are not. In Pennsylvania, uh, they allowed frack waste to go into municipal treatment plants, like where you treat your shit waste from home, okay? And they put it in there, and then after some amount of time, they found downstream users had salty water and it was causing equipment problems for industrial users. I mean, this was a plan that wasn't very well thought out. You know, it took care of perhaps of a small fraction of the pollution, but not of the overall picture. And the state allowed that to happen. So to my mind, that says inadequate forethought and inadequate regulatory schemes from the get-go. New York is trying to be a little bit more thoughtful, but it's not clear that even there that their five or seven year process to get through to actually approving fracking will be any more protective in the long run. Again, it's back to the unresolved issue of how do you treat the waste. Um, another instance of inadequate regulatory framework is in Wyoming. They've been putting in these wells and flaring or whatever else is associated, and they've ended up with a smog situation which parallels or is equivalent to major cities. Again, who would, who would deliberately do that kind of thing? You've got pristine environments. You've got people who are out there because they value that environment, and here you've trashed it. And you look back and you say, well, how the hell did that happen? Why, why'd that happen? So all of that to me speaks to the, you know, the, the regulatory frameworks are not sufficient at this time for prudent implementation of fracking. All right, so that's about, that's about the whole pitch. Uh, but I wanted to allow for either further questions or for some other discussion as well. So um, maybe I went through this a little bit too fast, but that's, uh, we are told 40 minutes, so we're, we're keeping to we that at the moment. We have 10 minutes left of the 40. What kinds of, uh, again, th this was meant to engage in the question of, you know, well, I love fracking and I want my gas, you know, versus, well, we should find another way to, you know, to live our lives. This was meant to enjoin that kind of discussion. So anyway, any questions, any, <coughs> Greg? Yeah, Jerome, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just coming in, so perhaps you touched upon this, but just on the way in this morning, NPR was running a segment on fracking, and they had all these editorial comments from these people saying, hey, it's come into my area. We didn't have anything going on here before. This has been great. I mean, the businesses here are doing great. The restaurants, you know, the, the, there's workers coming in. Now the diner is full all the time. Um, so there, there's this sense that, hey, this is the economic boom. So how do you kind of respond when people are just looking for jobs? That's a good point, and I don't have a, I, I don't have a quick, quick canned answer. I'll say uh, I, watch fr I watched Frack Nation recently, which is also sort of a counterpoint to Gasland. Um, and it talked about people in the Delaware River Basin, or perhaps even New York State, who are banking on this money to keep their property, perhaps keep their farm going, and so forth. So I mean, that's uh, how do I answer that? Uh, uh, I would, if I Norbert. could say, very short term. Very short term. Um, I know Williamsport, Pennsylvania. We have friends who live there. They're building, uh, putting more motels and more because they, they're fracking in that area. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, oh, people, the workers are coming in. Well, for, you know, the jobs are not going to be in the fracking for most of them because they're bringing in the workers from out, outside. Once they get a lot of this set up, most of those workers will be leaving. So That's, that is true. Your, your um, restaurants, diners, and motels aren't going to be full for a very long time. It's a, and, and this is one of the problems in our country. We are very short-sighted and uh, um, very myopic in what we view, how we view things. So, you know, we, uh, a year, oh, we, we forget what the, the 2008 and 2009, what the economy is like when, when the market goes up now in 2013, and we live as if life is going to be that way forever and ever, and we don't see the patterns. Do you have any, what would you have suggested, Greg? Um, and the short term is, is good. Um, you know, I, something that I've seen is there is an in, inequity that comes with this. Um, in some of the areas that I've seen this in upstate New York, um, you may have people who um, are approached by developers to drill on their land, 
and they cash in tremendously. Mm -hmm. And it's their neighbors who are ending up dealing with the environmental fallout, and they don't get the economic boom. They can't leave, and they're, they're stuck behind. Um, so there's this sense of, um, you know, uh, tearing apart a community, um, and uh, I, I think just people need to be aware that this inequity comes out of this as well. That's a good there point. There is tremendous wealth, but it's not evenly distributed. It's not everybody shares. Let me, I'll point out something that dovetails somewhat, two things. I was one day uh, in a couple years ago, I went down to the fracking fields in Pennsylvania, and I met, I just talked to a couple of, an elderly couple, you know, what were their impressions of this whole thing? Their, their point was, my local government doesn't care about me. I'm being impacted, I don't want this, but they don't care about me. They're supporting the over, they're supporting the fracking people. So there's another aspect of the in inequity, um, is just representation and advocacy. Um, this is sort of a galling thing about uh, New York State. There's compulsory integration. They have certain planning blocks, 460, 640 acres or so in size. If they get 60% of those landowners to agree to allow fracking to occur in that, in that area, the other 40% are not given any say in the matter. Their, their, essentially, their, their personal rights or property rights are put to the side and they're, they're allowed, the uh, activity is allowed to proceed. Again, so uh, just another instance of um, you know, what you know, the benefits that some might be gaining may not be shared by all the people in that particular community even, you know, or that land block. So that was a good example. Another, I think the, Liz had another thought. Well, I, I just want to say what I personally saw with my own eyes in Ringwood, up in Ringwood State Park, where, they're, where they felled the trees and to lay the, for, for the laying of the pipeline, all out-of-state license plates. You're not seeing local people working on this. You're seeing Kentucky, uh, Illinois, Maine, uh, all different kinds of states. Out of town workers. Mm -hmm. There's, I think they're staying on Route 23 in the motel, motel there. Yeah. yeah. You know. So, uh, mm -hmm. Norbert made Norbert made the point that when when the work is done, there's nothing to see but a, a, a wellhead with some piping and a couple of tanks. There's nobody there. They're not doing security. They're not doing monitoring. They're using electronics to do that stuff. They have a guy who will manage that region and check on it once a week, perhaps, for some physical checks. But it, there's no permanent. Like you said, it's a bubble. You know, a lot in many regards, it's a bubble. Another bubble that you know the local environment, the local economy will be subject to a burst of at some point because it's not meant to maintain ten new, you know, even ten new jobs in the fracking community. They do the work. It's intensive. They're gone. They're gone. Mm -hmm. And there's essentially no presence left after that at the well uh, location itself. Other questions? It takes a toll on our roads, all these trucks coming yeah, in and out, carrying big logs and uh, whatever they use, the pipes themselves. They're destroying. Our roads are in terrible shape anyway. By the way, they're also getting wealthy uh, selling the, the, uh, timber. the wood, the timber that they they've cut down. Is that right? Wow. Yes, right. Other so questions or points? This is, this is like a traveling boom or something? It's a traveling boom, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but mm -hmm. you'll still hear numbers like 20,000 man hour, you know, 20,000 man years, but there, there's a way of accounting that allows them to ex exaggerate those numbers beyond the normal rational person's conception. In a real way, it's like an avalanche when you said it's a rolling boom. But uh, an avalanche that destroys everything in its path. But we know, that, we know that the people involved in approving whatever needs to be approved are not bad people, they're people like us. So what is the, the major benefit Money. that they see <laughs> in allowing this kind of uh, activity to go on? Uh, I think principally you're talking about people at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I think that that's sort of where the level he's talking about. Or local legislature. Well, that, it, no. A lot of those decisions are not. We, we've had interaction with people in uh, West Milford. They, they, the local, they've been getting plans and so forth, but they were not asked their opinions on, you know, is this a good thing? Those decisions are made at the federal level, you know, by way of a certificate of convenience and public necessity or something like that. I just think that the term. So whether, I'm getting off the track. 
Uh, well, wasn't the mayor of West and the former mayor of West Milford at our yes. uh, Monksville Reservoir yes. demonstration? Yes. And they spoke and said they did not know this was happening until after the approval was given. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Now, there, the, the local the municipal government. Right, that was a municipal, the municipal government. Another aspect, of, and I'm not saying that I'm advocating all this, but another thing that I think has driven the federal response to the fracking issue is that we are replacing, largely replacing coal, this is what's said, we're replacing coal burning with gas burning, and that this is, this is a much more efficient process, and therefore, this is the reason why we should be doing it. We're getting rid of, and, and, it's, and well, from what I've read, we are getting rid of coal-fired power plants. They're being allowed to, to go to, to, to waste uh, and replace with more efficient gas. So that, that's the way I interpret the Obama administration's response. In other words, they, they, they're, they're just throwing up their hands and saying, go ahead, do it. Uh, yeah. How do you answer that? Well, the second bullet, major bullet point on what... Uh, For some reason, this chart didn't come up when I was going doing this earlier. Okay. But I mean, natural oh, gas it. itself yeah. is an inherent global warmer. I mean, if you leak natural gas out of, a, out of your home, that's going to cause ground, you know, global warming, period. Coal and, coal and oil don't really have that same problem. Plus, being a gas, it wants to get out of the pipe. It wants to get out of it. It wants to leak. You know, so, and then when you burn it, you've got your CO2 end of the problem. So it's like it's a problem on both ends. Yeah. Um, and all the money that's going into this is not going into renewables. That's true. And, and to, the, to the studying and the working of renewables. I just want one curious thing about, I mean, you didn't bring this slide up, but um, I was talking about this to my class, and, and I, th there's a, there's an, actually, we have two federal agencies that map methane in the atmosphere. And um, they, in 2005, they produced a world map of methane in the atmosphere, which clearly showed you where the major sources of methane were in 2005. And they clearly were in Russia and the Middle East, and strangely, one in South America, which I don't understand. I, so I was looking for a 2013 or 2012 map. They didn't ma they haven't mm. made it yet. Mm. Because if they do make a 2012 map, you'd be able to compare the 2012 map right. with the 2005 map and right. supposedly then see a little if bit more over fact, the United States. There's more <laughs> coming from Pennsylvania and, and, and yeah. the, the Midwest. Yeah, which they, it, just, it doesn't exist. It has not come out yet. Yeah. I mean, so for, uh, just to go back to the question earlier, I think that between, I mean, several years ago we got the conception that migrating to gas would be a good idea to get off coal, and I think that there was may have been made with a good heart. They may have done made that decision, that comparison, with good reason. I think that we've learned between leakage rates and whatever else, or dam, you know, that it's not as good. A, it's not a clean fuel, first of all. It does have its own detractors, global warming included, and. Uh, the, the decision we made a couple of years ago to just move in that direction was uh, premature and ill-founded in some ways. And we're, we're still, we're dealing with the problems now. People are investing billions of dollars in pipelines. They're gonna wanna run those pipes for 30 to 50 years, you know, and if we allow that to happen, you know, it, forget it. I, I have no vision of what well, we're the gonna- rate, the, the rate of increase of, of methane in the atmosphere over the past two years has now return to the levels of increase that we had between 1980 and, and 2000. So we did level off for a while. I mean, one of the things that happened was between 2000 and 2005, the methane concentration in the atmosphere actually started to decrease. So there was a feeling among federal planners that we were doing a good job of, seal, of, of capping all the leaks. Uh, whether that was true or not, nobody knew. Nobody really knew that that was happening, but it was going down. Hmm. Now it's gone, it's just, it's just gone back up. So the fact that it has gone back up is good evidence that this whole business is, you know, turning, turning the uh, stopcock, uh, opening the stopcock again uh, to an uh, atmospheric method. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, Hi, Harriet. Uh, 
we're sort of over time, but we'll take uh, we'll take one or any other comments from the students. Any? Did this make uh, did this make you feel more uh, favorable on fracking or less favorable? Or uh, come on, share your share your opinions. <laughs> We should have come up with a nicer name for it. It just sounds like a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a bad thing. That's <laughs> right. Uh, but has there any been any, any uh, like human impact, like full on like sickness and? Oh yeah, yeah. If you if you watch a movie like Gasland, um, and again, some people would say the Gasland was biased, okay? But if you look at Gasland, you'll see a number of different people who have peripheral neuropathy, which I guess is something where you can't feel so well or you can't taste so well anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one example. There, There's a so lot of there anecdotal uh, evidence. Uh, I, just personally, I know somebody who lives in the Poconos who is uh, asking for more information, knowing that I'm involved with this group, because um, she and her husband have been looking around, and she said, we see things changing, and nobody's talking about it. And we see people getting sick. Um, and she also she sent me a uh, mentioned knowing people down in the Texas area where this is happening who uh, wrote and said, you, you can't believe what's happening. Please try to fight what is going on. I mean, that's a lot of you know, secondhand anecdotal things, but um, yeah. There, all right, there's another town mm -hmm. called Dish, Texas, uh, and a mayor used to go on speaking tours relating to fracking. In his community, I believe they had clusters of elevated illness. And so my point is, if you were to, if you were to Google Dish Texas, um, you know, now they have pipelines going through their community. It's not a fracking community, it's a pipeline community, but they have compressors and other types of equipment that are susceptible to leakage. And I believe that if you were to look at that, there'd at least be those, you know, suspected illnesses or something. As far as proved, that may be a little bit harder to come. But again, this is relatively new technology. It's only been exercised relatively recently. Um, but there is, there is, if you look at gasoline, again, there, there are testimonies. There are people who have been affected physically by, uh, you know, being near fracking areas or something. So we I will say, yes, right there, are, the there are potential human impacts. Yeah. We come from right up the road, Hompton Lakes. <laughs> Burger Dupont. Yeah. Uh, have you followed some of the things that have gone up uh, on? Well, you know, look at some of the history, and um, you know, this is all new stuff now. How long ago was Dupont there, and it's still having an impact? Oh, the Second like, World War, right? That right. World War II. Right. So we're talking 50 years plus, and we don't know the long-term effects of fracking yet. Certainly, livestock. I, I know I've heard oh. livestock fatalities yes. from the fracking waste dump. Yes. And yeah. You know, yeah. getting into the water supply for livestock and that. killing off yeah. cattle. And yeah. Jerome, did you talk about the radioactivity, the radon in it, too? Because that health impact. Well, he did so mention well, the, I mentioned the radon. Bring up, elucidate the uh, radon thing, please, for the group. Yes. I did not talk about that. Right. So, uh, particularly in some shale deposits, particularly in Marcellus, where, uh, you know, I think uh, Jerome probably talked a lot about that there is a high radioactive content in the ground. It's naturally occurring. It's supposed to stay down there. It's not supposed to come up. And what's happening when they um, are fracking is that they are bringing that up with the wastewater and also with the gas. And so the concern, and there are now a few peer-reviewed studies, not many, but there are, will be more, is that the um, radon content that is coming through both in the gas, so that it needs, you need a certain number of days for it, radon to break down to a level that is safe. Now, I, you could argue there's no safe level of radon in your gas. But in any event, if we start getting here in New Jersey or in New York City, uh, the supply of gas from the Marcellus, it would not have enough days for it to become safe for us. And so that is then coming in as you turn your stove on. So that is also a potential harmful health impact that is there that is not being explored. There's no, we should have public hearings on that. We should be having our government representatives, city council in New York City, talking about that. and. We should be learning more about that. There is um, some studies that have been done uh, by a uh, Professor Resnikoff on the radon around the pipe itself, because it actually 
causes the pipe, uh, the, the radioactive material, not the radon itself, but that causes the pipe to corrode, and then that can cause the pipes to leak, and then what does that do to the path of it? So that is a whole nother health potential impact and area that is a is not being discussed. And so again, we don't have all the answers and we don't understand exactly yet all of the potential ramifications, but it should be an issue that our public officials are looking at and asking for more studies on. So certainly that is also coming up with the wastewater. So the health impacts of that wastewater that are bringing up all the frap fluid that have these chemicals we don't know what they are, plus what's already in the ground, and then where are they putting that wastewater? That, if you talk about the wastewater. You, you mentioned that, that they're actually piping the wastewater through pipes? Mm -hmm. I thought the wastewater was going into trucks that were coming to New Jersey as trucks. They want to put the, transport the waste through pipes. Is that, that's the... I, I had not heard that either, Norbert, but I didn't want to challenge you. Oh, okay. I had heard I mean, that. that's, that, that's, that's a really, the, the I mean, you have a corrosive liquid that you're going to pump right. through pipes. Well, the, well, and get methane is not corrosive. Right. Well, right, it, right. The problem with the waste, though, is that there is no safe way to treat crap waste currently. And so it is going in pits, it is going... Potentially. No, but, but he's... But he, yeah, he, I, he I, I had understood that that then. was part of the pipe situation. Because I, have to that would be carrying more radon yeah. than the methane. Right, mm -hmm. right. Unless, unless they're really sloppy. But what about the trucks? Oh, yeah. And where are they going to dump it? Yeah, well, that's, okay. yeah, no, I, I know that. Yeah. Right, and until it's classified as a hazardous waste, there is potential for it to be, because they need to get rid of it now. There, it's just, oh, there's yeah. too no, much accumulating in Ohio stock. I'm just surprised to hear that they were pumping it through Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't even think they do that in Texas. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's know. possible, right. but that's crazy. <laughs> a lot of, to do with this is crazy. That's the whole thing. That's is that it's crazy, crazy and nobody's. And there's no about regulation. It. Right. And well, yeah. there is regulation, but if, if you what it's you say true. is true about radon, yeah, and there are regulations about moving radon. You well, can't move radon into a state. Well, I except that it is not because it's coming up through the pipes with the gas. That is what again is being raised by these different. Um, scientists that are looking at it now, we need more studies on it. We need to understand it better, that it, that it could migra it's migrating just up with the gas and with the wastewater. And but there so are ways of getting it out. Yes. And well, I think the, right. threat, the current methane, in the current natural gas industry removes right. radon from their gas before they put it in pipes. Right. If the fracking industry is not doing it, right. because maybe because it's so close. Right. Well, again, um, you, you're absolutely then that's right. So it needs to be. It's it another issue discussed. which I'd never heard of before. Yeah. And that's. Thank you for your attention. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's just uh, another question or comment. Um, uh, there's so much. There's so much money in, in fracking, of course. Um, geez, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Um, what was that? Uh, what's the realistic possibility of it? Um, it actually being stopped. I mean, we're reactive. <laughs> we're uh, the, thing is, the, thing, the thing is, it's because we're a reactive society. So I don't think anything real is going to happen until you have about 300 dead people in one good proven site because of fracking, and that's the that's unfortunate thing. That's a good point. I, I mean, that's one of the challenges. It's definitely a challenge. You know, I don't have an answer. Uh, how are we going to change it? First of all, we can't give up hope that we can. That's the first thing. And if you can avoid that, you're doing good. Um, then it's calling the president, tell him to stop, stop the damn fracking. You know, uh, and again, even that's a very small thing, but it is an empowering thing. Then it's talking to family and friends. I don't talk to my family about this. I should. Why don't I? You know, that, that kind of thing. Then somehow h hooking it in with the climate thing. You know, maybe climate's a big enough issue that that can help drive this whole thing eventually. So we, you know, reconfigure our energy use, make this obsolete, you know, uh, learn to live with, you know, learn to live with what's available, blah, 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 you know, uh, beyond, I, so don't give up hope, that's the first thing. And, I mean, spread the word, because I mean, I, I can guarantee you I can ask 50 people outside and only one would want fracking. Exactly. For sure. Oh, for yeah, sure. Yeah, found yes. that out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your attention and interest. Thank you. Yes, thank you.